Let the healer set me free. I'm happy to be in the truth. And I will daily lift my hands. For I will always sing of when your love came down. I could sing of your love forever. I could sing of your love forever. I could sing of your love forever. I could sing of Daniel chapter 3, as we continue our series and values that stand the test of time, and tonight we want to talk about developing trust. I, I just tell you this, loved ones, right off the, the bat, if we don't learn to trust, we're not going to go very far with God or with anybody else. A question that everyone needs to answer is, whom will I trust? Whom will I trust? We are a society that really is skeptical. We're full of unbelief. We're full of doubt, especially when it comes to relationships. We have a really hard time believing about the God of the Bible, really wanting to have relationship with us. And so, because we've been burned, maybe because of what our theology has been or what our experience has been, sometimes we have a real skepticism even towards God. We really wonder. Can I really trust God? And then, of course, if I went around the room tonight and asked this particular question, how many of you have been burned in relationships? Every hand would go up in this place. And so it makes us want to stand a distance and away from individuals because we don't want to trust. But I, I want you to hear a, a truth, at least what I believe to be a truth, and that is this. I believe that trust in relationships, whether we're talking towards the Lord or if we're talking towards one another, is the oil that really runs relationships. And the reason why a lot of people are really isolated and alone tonight is because they have chosen, because of hurt or because of bad experiences in relationships, therefore I will never have another close relationship, and we just make an island of ourselves and we really don't trust individuals. It's not a good deal. It's not a good thing. God wants us to trust. God wants us to know that we can trust not only him, but we can trust other people. A recent survey showed people who we distrust the most and the ones we trust the most. 
Let me tell you the ones that we distrust the most. Number one, telemarketers. <laughs> Those people that just have that sense to call you as you put your fir first bite of dinner in your mouth. You know the ones I'm talking about? I have a son-in-law that taught me something about this. He says, when they call me, he said, I ask them their name. And so they'll politely give him their name, like Joe. And he says, Joe, I want to tell you something. I'm going to start praying for a better job for you. <laughs> and then hangs up. Number two is this. Now, really, this is really kind of, I'm on both sides of this, so be patient with me and understand. Second people that, you know, or a category of individuals that people really don't trust are used car salesmen. For those of you that don't know, that's the way I made my living for a number of years. And now I'm a preacher, and now you're really wondering, aren't you? <laughs> what is this guy doing? And then number three is this. The lowest on the totem pole, and you guessed it, politicians. Now, the ones we choose, the mo or choose to trust the most are, number one, pharmacists. The people you get your drugs from. And then number two is this, pastors. So I'm going to give you a little dose of medicine tonight, okay? Here's what we want to talk about. If we don't trust God, listen to this, loved ones. If we don't trust God, we will create an idol out of something, and we'll begin to place our trust in that idol. In Psalms 105, it talks about people that create they're idols. They make them out of silver and gold, the psalmist says. They have hands, but they can't feel. They have eyes, but they can't see. They have feet, but they can't walk. They have ears, but they can't hear. And then it goes on to say this. Those who, now get this word, those who trust in them will become like them. And here's what God is saying. And, and let me just say this to you is that anything can become an idol. It can be a car that's sitting out there in the parking lot this evening. It can become a, a car. Actually, it can even become good things. An idol can become a family. Anything that takes the number one place in your heart is what the Bible calls an idol. And the reason why God says, I don't want you to trust in idols is because whatever that idol is that we have chosen to put our trust in is going to disappoint you. It can never live up to your expectations. And that's what happens to a lot of individuals. They think about the dream home. If I just had this dream home and then they take years, and by the way, I'm not against anybody having a dream home, and neither is God for that matter. But what happens then is that everybody puts their resources and thinking into this over months and years and all the rest of it. And then it comes and they live in it for a little while and then they find out, well, this doesn't meet my expectations either. And God is saying in a very real way, when you begin to put your trust in anything other than me, then what you're going to end up is disappointed. And I don't want you to be disappointed. I want you to trust me because I'm the one that can provide what your expectations are. I'm the one that really can bring solidity into your life. I'm the one that can take you to the next step. But we have a society today that allows individuals to create their own idol, to create their own God. And really what it is, and, and I just kind of thought about this myself, I believe what really is going on in our society today is not anything new, first of all, but it's something that has gone on for all of mankind and, and basically back to the Garden of Eden. Listen to this. <clears throat> People want to create a God that they can control. They want to create a God that is basically under their control so they can do what they want to. And now what we have in our society is we have people that are espousing this kind of theology and basically saying, God is within you. All you have to do is find out who this God is and just kind of go with whatever you believe might happen to be God. And this simply is what we call in theology or theological terms is syncretism. I'll take a little bit from this religion and I'll take a little bit from that religion. I'll put a little bit of my own self in this 
And then we come out with our own God that basically we can control ourselves. And God says that's an idol. God says that's not something that you can trust. That's not something you can really develop relationship with. As a matter of fact, we have, you know, what I would call uh, talk show theologists. <laughs> and basically, like what I'm talking about is Oprah Winfrey. Understand this about Oprah, and I don't have a thing in the world against Oprah, but she's a spiritualist. She's not a Christian. And she will basically say to you, you can have permission to believe in any kind of God that you want. And by the way, that is really not a true statement at all. Because when you take the word believe, and really comes from Latin, and I know we've talked about it in this room a lot of times, be means to live, and leave means in accordance with. And a lot of times the God that people create is not something that they can live in accordance with. For example... Have you ever been talking to someone and you get into the philosophy of life and you ask them what their philosophy of life is and you get the distinct impression that that person is making it up as they're speaking? <laughs> you know that one? There are so many people, and hear this, people, and here's the travesty of this particular example that we're talking about. A lot of people will base their eternity upon what they think is truth. And here's a really scary thought. I mean, a really scary thought that really ought to put trembles in all of us tonight. A lot of people are getting their theology from Hollywood. I mean, I, I cannot believe how many times I hear people, well, I really felt like they really spoke. And they could have said something that's true, but I want you to know. It's like, you know, um, Star Wars. If I ask the question, how many in here have seen Star Wars? Probably every hand would go up. And what does it say in there? It says, the force be with you. You know, and really what we have is a God that, you know, has a good side and a bad side. And let, let me just say this. I've watched Star Wars, and before any of you think I'm getting legalistic, I'm not. But I just want to say this to you. Don't take your theology from that. Watch the movie and enjoy it, but don't take your theology from it because it's not God. It doesn't have anything to do with God, or at least the God that we serve. It might have something to do with a small God, but not the God of the Bible, you see. As a matter of fact, um, now I'm really going to step on some toes, but since you're in here and I've already taken the offering, big deal. Yeah. <laughs> Listen to this. Cheryl and I, the other night, we went to, um, we went to see, and, every, and you know, every time I say something about movies, or you get a letter, or I can't believe you recommend, I'm not recommending this. I'm just telling you, I went to see it because I thought it was, uh, it was something that kind of, I wanted to see what Hollywood was saying, and that was Bruce Almighty. And you know what I really came away? And there were some cute things in there and all the rest of it. You know really what, what the message was? God's a man. God's just another man. Kind of look at that and walk away and, 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 and get this theology straight. God runs, get this really straight. There is such a chasm between man and God that only one person could actually in, come in between that and his name was Jesus. And let me whisper another point of theology to you. You will never be God. <laughs> Nor will I. There's one, you see. And then, then we have this, this one called George Burns. Remember, oh God? You remember that one? Oh God. And here's kind of a, and don't take this out of context, but kind of a bumbling little old man that walks around with a cigar in his mouth that really doesn't have the answers. And people come away Christians come away sometimes with thinking, wow, you know, I really think they had something to say there. Well, it's entertainment, people, but it's not theology. And it's not the God of the Scriptures at all. Another one. Well, and this is just ideas that come out and people, you know, is that God is some kind of a granddad. And, and hear this tonight. It is so true. Most people in the Western world, and especially in the United States today, we do live in a post-Christian era. These people are deists. A lot of people in our, in our culture today are deists. They believe in this grandfather type of God that kind of created this thing and then took away off because he had a lot of other things to do in the universe and just kind of left it up to us to go on as however we would choose. 
And people, you know what the real point of the, all these different things that I've been talking about as far as where people get their ideas from God? It doesn't matter what I believe. It doesn't matter what you believe. It doesn't matter what I believe is truth, and it doesn't matter what you believe is truth. Because the only thing that really matters are the facts. And God says there are no other gods but me. And, and hear this. Hear it really clearly tonight. Relationships are the strongest around truth. And the reason why a lot of people do not trust God is because they don't know God. They know a lot of different things about gods with a small g, but they don't know about the God that we serve. And so it comes back to this revelation, to back to this understanding that we really have to know that God wants us to have relationships. And the way that we have relationships is we learn to trust what truth is, and the Bible tells us what's truth. And what we're going to talk about tonight are the three Hebrew children. We're going to talk about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And we're going to talk about three individuals that were really up against a culture that believed in a false god. And they chose to, to serve. They chose to trust. They chose to believe that the God that they had experienced, the God that they had been taught about, was the true God, and God delivered them. And when we get to a place, loved ones, just, just hear it clearly tonight. When we get to a place in our life, and every one of us, are, and maybe some of us are here this evening, we're going to get to a place in our life where, if I can say it this way, the test of your faith is really going to come. Cultural influences or demonic influences or whatever influences that we might be around. It may be another human being that's saying something to us that puts us into a test of faith. It's at those moments that we learn to trust. And it's a principle, hear this, it's not just a principle that goes on here in the 21st century. This is a principle that we will live with for the rest of eternity is learning to trust God. And hear this clearly tonight. The reason why we can trust God is because His character is the same yesterday, today, and forever. There is no shifting of shadow. There's not even a little bit of darkness in Him. God is light. And He says, the way I have been in the past is the way I will be in the future. And if you trust me today, I can guarantee I'm going to be there for you tomorrow. And you know, one of the reasons why the Apostle Paul talks about, you know, a fight of faith is because every one of us get into situations in our life where we have to fight through again and saying, God, I'm going to trust you. And here's the reason why. And we're going to read about it tonight. Lots of times the circumstances that we find ourselves in doesn't look like God. It's like I'm in a situation right now, Dan, and you wouldn't believe what's going on in my life, and I just wonder if God's around. Well, the principle is, is that we always trust God regardless of what we feel. You know, the best definition I know of a carnal Christian, which is really a contradiction in terms, is one that believes in what he feels rather than what he knows. And God says, I'll never leave you, nor will I forsake you. I will always be there. We need to practice what we know, not what we feel. And understand that's exactly what the three Hebrew children were going through. They were going through a time where Nebuchadnezzar had set up this idol, and he put an incredible influence on his culture to bow down and worship this idol. And the three Hebrew children said, we're not going to do it. And that's where we pick up the story in verse 13. Furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar summoned Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So these men were brought before the king. And Nebuchadnezzar said to them, is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the image of a of gold I have set up. Now, when you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipes, and all kinds of music, if you are ready to fall down and worship the image I've made, very good. But if you do not worship it, you will be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. I would say that would separate the men from the boys right there, wouldn't it? Then what God would be able to rescue you from my hand? And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, O oh, Nebuchadnezzar, I just love this. 
the right response to this. We don't need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are throwing into the blazing furnace that God we serve is able to save us from it. And he will rescue us from your hand, O king. But even if he does not, huge statement right there. We want you to know, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar was furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And his attitude toward them changed. He ordered the furnace heated seven times harder than usual and, and commanded some of the strongest soldiers in the army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the blazing furnace. So these men, wearing their robes, trousers, turbans, and other clothes, were bound and thrown into the blazing furnace. The king commanded command was so urgent and the furnace was so hot that the flames of the fire killed the soldiers who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, firmly tied, fell into the blazing furnace. That's an interesting part there. Why did they have to fall into the furnace? Why couldn't they have fallen out and away from it? Verse 24. Then King Nebuchadnezzar leaped to his feet in amazement and asked his advisors, Weren't there three men that we tied up and threw into the fire? And they replied, certainly, O king. And he said, look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed. And the fourth looks like the sons of God. And I like it better in the King James where it says the son of God. Far better. Yeah, verse 26. And Nebuchadnezzar then approached the opening of the blazing furnace, and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out. Come here. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire, and the sartraps, and the perfects, and the governors, and the royal advisors crowded around them, and they saw that the fire had not harmed their bodies, nor was a hair of their heads singed. Their robes were not scorched, and there was no smell of fire on them. Listen to this now. Then Nebuchadnezzar said, Praise be to the God of Shadrach. Meshach and Abednego, who, was, who has sent an, his angel and rescued his servants. Notice this. They trusted in him and defied the king's command and were willing to give up their lives rather than to serve or worship any other god except their own. If you have your little outlines you want to follow along this evening, let's take a look at five truths to consider to cultivate trust in God. Five truths to consider to cultivate trust in God. Number one is this. Learn to trust the discernment God gives. Learn to trust the discernment God gives. Verse 15. Now when you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipes, and all kinds of music, if you are ready to fall down and worship the image, I made very good. Now, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, which I will probably call Sam from time to time, had learned this process of discernment. When they heard something that wasn't God, they knew it. Nebuchadnezzar evidently had developed some kind of a musical score that went around with this idol. And I, just, I, I just want you to know this and hear it, is that a few weeks ago we talked about, you know, when, when we hear truth, we know it. And when we hear something that's not truth, we know it. And somehow, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, when they heard all this stuff going on, when they saw the idol going up, there was some kind of discernment going on, this isn't God. As a matter of fact, I was thinking about this with Moses. Moses in Exodus 32 with the golden calf rebellion that was going on. And God says, Moses, get yourself down quickly from the mountain for these people that you have brought out of Egypt have corrupted themselves. And so on his way down, Joshua hears a sound and he turns to Moses to talk to him about this sound. And, and Moses says, first of all, Joshua, it's not the sound of defeat that I hear and it's not the sound of victory that I hear, but it's singing. And what Moses had heard is these people in worship before. He knew what it was when God was in the presence of these people, but immediately he understood that this was a different kind of a sound that was coming out. And by the way, I am not talking about some kind of music preference tonight. I'm talking about when the Spirit of God is indicating to us in any kind of situation, watch out. 
Now let me tell you what I think is going on here. And it's interesting to note that we're talking about two different idols. We're talking about the calf and we're talking about this idol that uh, Nebuchadnezzar had raised up. And there were distinct sounds in both of them that weren't God. 1 John 4.1 says this, that we need to test the spirits to see if they are from God. How do we test those spirits? Is there really a spirit of discernment that when we come to know God that He really puts inside of us? I believe it's true. I think what happens to us is this. I know it's my Achilles heel in more ways than one, and that is this. Lots of times in my heart, I register something that isn't right. Now listen to this carefully. But I don't take the time to stop and analyze what I'm feeling, what I'm sensing, and what I believe God is saying to me. And because of hurry, believe you me, people, hurry is a curse. I mean, when we are in such a, a mode that we've got to get things done, that we pass over discernment, what happens to us is that we don't develop trust in God. And what happens in that is that when I violate that trust, when I violate actually that discernment, then instead of growing in trust, I get ticked at God because I feel like He's led me astray, when all the time God has been speaking to us. See, I don't think it's going to happen on the day of judgment when we get up there and say, God, why did you allow me to get in deception that he's going to say, well, the reason was. The point of it is, is that God has given us discernment. And when we obey that discernment, when we understand, you know, this is just not a conversation I should be in, or this is not a place I should go to, or this is something I shouldn't be doing, and there's that, you, we know it unmistakably as God, that when we begin to obey that and believe that, and I think that's exactly what's going on with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, is they have learned this discernment over a period of time, and they just said it never leads us astray. And trust begins to develop in our lives because we've learned to cultivate the discernment that God has given to us, and He never leads us astray. Amen? Amen. Number two. Knowing God over time reveals He is trustworthy. Knowing God over time reveals he is trustworthy. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, verse 17, the God we serve is able to save us from it, and he will rescue us from your hand. The process of coming to this point of trust in God for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego wasn't built overnight. It takes time. You ever notice that? It takes time to really build trust in any kind of relationship. But here's something that is, that is phenomenal, I believe, about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego is, is this particular statement. You know, it's one thing when you know the outcome of the story and you say, I trust God. It's quite another when you don't know the outcome of the story. See, we're, we're sitting here with the benefit of knowing that they're going to get rescued, but they didn't. And that puts a whole other light on the subject. And I would just kind of like to go down a path tonight and suggest to some of our thinking tonight that the reason that we don't want to trust is because we don't know what the outcome is going to be. For instance, if you're watching some kind of a suspense thriller on TV or a movie of some sort, and so I was going back in my mind and trying to be really safe, and I was thinking about Jaws. You know what I mean? The old, the old one, Jaws, the old movie Jaws. And that movie scared me. I mean, when that thing came out of the, you know, it says, and you know it's coming, and you're saying, I'm not going to get scared, and then it, it, it gets you, and it just kind of, it just kind of does something to that macho image that you thought you had, you know? <laughs> but anyway, what I realize, and my wife probably has helped me along this path, is that when you're watching a real suspense thriller, maybe like Speed, is you're thinking in your mind, how is Hollywood going to end this thing? And what we have found out, if the star is in the middle of a really tight situation, you can have absolute peace that they're going to make it through because Hollywood will never kill the star. <laughs> but anyway, what I have figured out is this, is that if I can figure it out how they are going to actually end this movie, then I don't have to live in suspense. And especially if it's a movie that you've already seen before. You know what I'm saying? 
You don't even have to worry about it. You know exactly how it's going to come out. But here's the point. When it comes to real life, listen to this, loved ones. We can't take the suspense out. And that's trust. I don't know how the story's going to end. But Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, whether he chooses to deliver us out of the fire or in the fire, we're going to trust him. And here's my point. That kind of trust does not come overnight. That kind of trust comes a little bit here and a little bit there. As a matter of fact, and I'm going to finish with this tonight. Hear it clearly tonight. Hear this one. If we don't trust God in the small things, we will never trust him in the big ones. Some of us are facing what we think are huge. And God's saying, but you don't know what I have planned for you. And if you don't choose to trust me here, you'll never choose to trust me out there. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were ready to lay down their lives. And I'm saying is because over a process of time, they learned to trust God. That's where God wants us to be. Number three is this. Trust grows in the environment of community. Trust grows in the environment of community. Verse 18. But even if, we, if he doesn't, we want you to know, King, that we will not serve your gods, or worship the image of gold you have set up. From, verse, from verses 16 to 18, nine different times plural personal pronouns were used describing more than one. Now, here's what, what's going on. Is Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are in a community. Now, and I, I've kind of thought about this. What if one, let's just take for Shadrach goes, <laughs> I ain't going in that furnace, guys. What would that have done to the community? And, and here's a really interesting point, you know, as far as individualism go, goes. What, what I do really does affect you. And what you do really does affect me. And we, have, we as a society have kind of believed this lie. As long as it doesn't hurt you, then it really doesn't matter what we do. And it's just not true at all. There's a community, and, and lots of times, and, and hear this clearly this morning, Lots of times the reason why other people are trusting God is simply because somebody in the community has said, I have trusted him and I know him to be real. I know it to be true. I know in my own life, watching other people that trusted God has been an incredible influence upon my life about what God wants to do in me. John 13, 34. Jesus is about ready to go to the cross. And he looks at these 12 guys and he says, a new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples. Now understand this. Jesus says, a new commandment. Something they hadn't heard before. There's a little community of 12 guys. And Jesus knows that's about what's about ready to take place. And he's saying to these guys, Guys, you're really going to go through some really tough times in your life. You don't know what's about ready to come, but I do. And the thing that's going to sustain you as you go through this tough time is if you love one another like I have loved you. That you don't ditch somebody when they're going through a tough time. That you stand there recognizing that as we go through tough times together and we, we continually... Say, but I, even though I have questions, as a matter of fact, Cheryl and I, mostly Cheryl has come up with this because of her situation in fighting MS. Is even though we don't understand, we still trust. See, and I, I don't think anybody within the Christian community that has, you know, any kind of sense at all would say that we have to understand everything. But sometimes, somewhere, somebody has to stand up and say, I'm just going to trust because I know who God is. And even though it doesn't look like God is in this situation right now, I know the character of God. And God says, trust me. God says that when I, when I trust him, what I do is I inspire faith in other people. And so Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego 
answered the king as though it was one voice and said, our minds are already made up. The community stayed together. And people just, just hear this. I'm sure most of us tonight are aware of the Kobe Bryant situation that has just come up. That has repeated, I don't know how many times, within the church. And I'm not talking about this specific church, but I'm talking about the church in general. And, I, and I'm saying to you that as I've watched people put their trust in somebody and then find out that they have some kind of a secret life that they didn't know about, when, hear it clearly. When trust is broken, it's one of the toughest things to regain in the world. And how you respond to situations in your life really does have influence on other people. You just can't go around and say, well, it's my life and I'll do with it what I want to. No, at some point, if we really trusted Christ, we surrendered and said, it's not about me. It's about others. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have love. And let me just say this to, to you. The foundation of all relationships, if we're going to have love, is based upon trust. And we don't have trust, people. We don't have anything. We don't have anything. Live your lives in such a way that other people gain influence towards trusting God. Believe God for that. Number four is this. Revelation from God in the battle enhances trust. Revelation from God in the battle enhances trust. Verse 23. And these three men, and verse 25 as well, and these three men firmly tied fell into the blazing furnace. Verse 25. And now Nebuchadnezzar has seen this, this God, the only true God in the furnace. Look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed, and the fourth looks like the Son of God. God could have certainly delivered these three guys before they went into the furnace, but he didn't. If God has the ability to deliver people before the fire or before the flood, why doesn't he do it? it we certainly can't say about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego they lacked faith. And so that's the reason that God didn't deliver them. As a matter of fact, these, these healthy guys that go up there to throw them into the furnace, they die, and, and that's the question that I posed when I was reading it. Why didn't Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego fall away from the furnace, but they fell into the furnace? See, and this, this raises all sorts of questions. See, some of us are going through some really difficult times. And we're asking the question, God, where are you? Why am I going through the fire? Why am I going through the flood? Why am I going through this particular disease? Why do I have these kind of financial problems? Why is this kind of situation going on at the job? Why am I in this kind of a disease? Why am I going through the fire? I don't understand. I don't get it. And people, I... I wish I had answers for you tonight, but I can tell you this one thing. There's something about us going through the fire that we get a revelation from God that we would never get if we didn't go through. They sign in the furnace, not before. They sign in the furnace. And all I can say to you is this. You know, like the old hymn, some through the water, some through the flood, some through the fire, but all through the blood is that when you get to the other side of what you're going through, you're going to have a revelation of God that you would have never had if you would have stayed on the other side. See, it's easy to trust when we know what the outcome is, but it's really difficult to trust in the middle of the furnace and saying, God, when the heat is really on, no pun intended, I still choose to trust you. I believe that you're going to deliver me. And then can I just throw this kicker in? You know what, what most of us try to do? Is we try to choose for God as to how he's going to deliver us. And it never works. I mean, you know, sometimes I give God at least five different options. <laughs> and you would, you would think 
that he could pick one of those. But being the infinite, all wise, loving, knowing God says, I got a way I can get you out of this. I would have never picked this way. Neither would have Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But they saw God in a way that very few people get to see God. Go through it. You know? And you do have a choice. A very little one. <laughs> but you do have a choice. And the choice is, am I going to trust you in this? And, and I, wished, I wished I didn't even have to bring this up. But so many times we use Romans 8.28 so out of context. You know, uh, everything will work together for good to those that love God and are called according to his purpose. And God will bring about good people. And I guess probably what I'm saying in that, that kind of a context is let's be really careful when people are going through really difficult times just to throw out Romans 8.28. Because the, the simple fact of the matter is in my 22 or 23 years of sitting across the table from people that are going through really difficult times, as a pastor, I don't have answers. But I can say this. When you get on the other side, you're going to know God better. You're going to have an understanding of him that you're not going to get anywhere else. Trust him. Trust him. Number five is this. We acknowledge that God gives revelation to others because we trust him. We acknowledge that God gives revelation to others because we trust him. Verse 28. Then Nebuchadnezzar said, Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who has sent his own angel and rescued his servants. They trusted him and defied their king's command and were willing to give up their own lives. Now, these men were willing to die in trust. Now, I want to say something here that I, I think every one of us just should really tune into is this. We will either die in trust or we will die out of trust. Very few conclusions have I come to in my life, but I have come to this particular conclusion. You die like you live. Every one of us in this room will die like we live, and if we have trusted God, when it comes to our time to die, we will die in trust. And if we have not trusted God, when it comes to our time to die, we will die out of trust. Years ago, I was in business with my dad, and one of the worst things that you can hear from a banker are these words. You're out of trust. I mean to tell you, that just, that just puts quivers in all sorts of people's livers. You know, it is just like, because you know why? You're frozen. You can't move. You're out of trust. And yet God says, I want you to live in trust. I want you to live trusting me. I want you to believe that every decision that I have for you is the best thing. And I really want to be honest with you at this particular time. I think one of the reasons why people, especially in America, are so bored with their faith is because at some point we stopped trusting. We got comfortable. And we thought, we'll build a life around this comfort. And God comes along and knocks down the doors and says, but I don't want you to live there. I want you to take another step. I want you to move with me in obedience. I want you to trust me again. And loved ones, hear it. Some of us here have never really trusted Christ with our lives. And what I mean by that, some of us here have never really crossed the line of faith yet and just saying, I know enough about you, Jesus, that I really need to trust you with my life. And see, this is the highest stakes game in town. Where are you going to spend eternity? And Jesus says, if you trust in me, I've got power over death. I can grant to you eternal life. But that takes trust. Saying, I'm going to trust you because I understand that you've never lied to anybody. You've never led anybody astray. But there's a second thing that I want to talk to us about tonight that are believers. 
In a couple of months, I'm going to ask this church to do something that we've never done before. And if you're suspecting it's money, you can put away your checkbooks because I'm not talking about money. I'm talking about some of us need to trust God in a whole new area. And what I felt from the Lord this afternoon as I was on my walk was this. Some of us need to say before we even know what the outcome is. Before we even know what the challenge is. And what I really felt impressed with with was this God I'm going to trust you no matter what you say I'm going to do it I'm going to trust you and people when we come to that place of just saying I'm submitted I'm surrendered regardless of how you're going to deliver me from this thing I'm going to do it there will be a new level of dynamite if I can put it that way or spirit or something that is infused into your life that you haven't experienced, or maybe you did and now it's gone, of basically saying, God, I want to start all over again. I want to trust you afresh and anew. I want my life to come alive. I'm not satisfied with where I am. I want to trust you again. People, what it does is it inspires others. Nebuchadnezzar looks out and goes, Wow, I see God. Because why? Three guys were saying, I trust him. I trust him. See? I trust him. I uh, hear it tonight, people. God wants us to trust him for things that are going to boggle our minds. But to say, Lord, you're going to influence other people into the kingdom because I've trusted you is going to be a great reward. Let's be people. Let's be a congregation. Let's be a community that says we're going to develop trust. Amen? Let's stand together. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we just bow before you. And I, I want to pray for individuals tonight, Lord, in two categories. Number one is this, those that have never trusted you before, that have never verbally asked you to come into their life. Lord, I pray for those right now that need to trust you for their salvation, that need to trust you as Lord and Savior and to surrender and ask for forgiveness of sins. If, if that's you and that's you're here tonight and you've never trusted the Lord, for your salvation. Would you raise your hand right now? Nobody else is looking around. And I'll pray for you real quickly. Okay, put them back down. Thank you. Lord Jesus, we bless you for these ones that are coming to you tonight. And we just know, Lord, that your scriptures are so true that you're faithful and just to forgive us of our sins when we ask for that. And so I ask right now, Lord, as they are asking that that new creation that new inner being, that infusion of your life into our lives would take place as these dear ones confess who you are and believe in you. And just representative of God's family, we say to you, welcome home. Welcome to the kingdom. Welcome to the family. And then the second group of people that I want to pray for are those that you feel you know, I just need to take a new step. I've just gotten comfortable where I am, and I, I haven't developed trust. I've just gotten to a place where I'm comfortable, but I haven't taken that step. And I'm not going to embarrass anybody here tonight, but if that's you, and you just recognize, I need to take that step, would you raise your hand so I can pray for you? Amen. Lord Jesus, we just come before you, and, and I put myself in that category. Oh, God. I ask tonight that your grace would enable every one of us that are choosing to trust you more. And the ones that you're working on, Lord, but just find that place of real surrender and recognizing that as we trust, as we hope in you, as we obey you, the greater releases will come to our lives so that others might know.
who you are. We're going to worship the Lord. And as we worship the Lord, I just want you to do business with God. Speak to him. Allow him to speak to you. Be obedient to what he's telling you to do. Let's worship the Lord. This is the air I breathe. This is the air I breathe.
Lord Jesus, we're so thankful tonight that uh, the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego is